Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker today. But before that, uh, just a couple of quick administrative announcements. Um, first of all, uh, we take the uh, questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom rather than through the chat. So Q&A for your questions. Secondly, if in preparation for um, Eric and his group's uh, presentation at 1040, if you're planning to do some uh, tea and mindful meditation, uh, please uh, prepare your teaware and tea in anticipation of that 1040 presentation. But for now, I'm pleased to uh, emphasize the global nature of the UC Davis Global Tea Initiative by introducing our next speaker, uh, Professor Mary Muchiri. Uh, Professor Muchiri is at the Department of Food Science and Nutrition at Kat Karatina University in Kenya. Um, Kenya is uh, particularly unique in its uh, ability to grow a red leaf camellia uh, tea plant uh, with some very exciting compounds in it not found in the green teas. Uh, Professor talk today is entitled Herbal Tea Drinks for Dietary Management of COVID-19, Myth or Facts. Professor Machiri, thank you for your lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Robert, for introducing me. I hope you, I can be had. Is that okay? Just confirm. Yes, you sound just fine. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, let me first of all try to open my presentation. See whether we can. Uh, oops. Just one minute, please. Um, Give me one minute as I introduce myself, like you've heard, my name is Dr. Mary Mushiri uh, from Karatina University. Particularly, I am in the Tea Institute of uh, Karatina University. And uh, the Tea Institute is a multidisciplinary uh, institute with members from different disciplines, from agriculture, from uh, business department, as well as uh, members from uh, food science and tourism. The Institute is quite new, just like the Global Tea Initiative, but uh, we do have uh, MOUs with different institutions. And in particular, we have uh, an MOU with the Global Tea Initiative, and as well as we have some initiative, uh, an MOU with the China. I hope I will be able now to do my presentation. Um, okay, let me do screen sharing. Yep. Can you see that? Is that visible? Please confirm. Yep, looks good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I took some little time uh, to come on, on board. But anyway, um, just like I was saying that uh, the, my name is Dr. Mir Mushiri. You could have not had the real uh, the word, but my, I'm sharing this with some of my members of the, of the T initiative in Karatina University, Dr. Maina and the Lydia Asiko. My talk today as it's been introduced is a herbal tea drinks for dietary management of COVID-19. And it's in a form of a question, is this a fact or is it just a myth or a, an imagination? Um, and that is how I'll be presenting and from that perspective. Um, oops, I just hope I can do in one minute, I don't know why the slide is not moving. Please just excuse me a little. 
whether I can come with it on a different perspective. Is, is this, can you see this? Yes, no problem. You're fine. I'm okay, thank you. So I would want to do an introduction um, to the presentation from a perspective of the effect, looking at the effect of uh, COVID pandemic on the livelihoods and on nutrition status of individuals. The impact that COVID-19 has had as per World Health Organization report is that it has increased the burden of unnourished and malnutrition persons. We know that uh, about one third of persons are undernourished, especially the uh, and mal and undergoing malnutrition, especially with the children under five in developing countries. So with COVID coming, it, this burden has been increased and previously it's been recorded like one third of the children are undernourished in developing countries. But now with pandemic coming, this has increased. And then you know that uh, with pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has reduced the economic power to purchase food. It has also restricted trade. I don't know whether you people get locked down like we do here, often it on and off. But when that happens, it means now people cannot buy and uh, do business as usual. There is also issues of income that comes with that. And uh, I'm very happy for the person, uh, was it Dr. Uh, what's her name? Nadia, who has presented before me, a very excellent presentation that also touches on the issues of mental health and psychological stress that, that as she was looking at from the ish, um, perspective of tea, but this is as a result, this has also been increased with this pandemic. Coming with that also is the issue of unemployment and crisis in the public health, more so in, with us at developed countries, uh, at, whereby you know, it is very expensive to undergo treatment. And all this culminating in uh, issues of food and nutrition insecurity. Um, I also want to emphasize that we are talking about Camellia sinensis, which is the most consumed beverage after water. Let me do a quick introduction and not take it for granted that uh, we all know what we are talking about. Tea, especially here, you know, where Kenya is well known for tea, we got two clones of tea. We got the green clone, which is green leaf. We also have an upcoming and has, is already in the market, a purple clone tea, purple tea, which is very rich in anthocyanin. I'll talk about it later. Then you got the processed, after all these two, we got the processed tea as outcomes of uh, different technologies. Quick one, just so that we can understand the diversity and the, what would come in as we're trying to look at uh, the use of tea in management of COVID. Because they have, of course, they have specialty teas, the white, the yellow, and the green, green being more popular. And, in, and now there is this purple tea that is rich in um, uh, flavonoids specifically anthocyanin that is also very popular and becoming very popular as it's uh, being developed and, and uh, exported worldwide. Of course, we have the black tea, which is uh, fully fermented or aerated during processing. So with that, you'd know that when we start talking about dietary management using tea, we've got a variation that is coming from the clone and we've got variations that are coming as a result of the processing procedure. As far as herbal or spice tea is concerned, we do have them either sweetened or unsweetened. Preferably, people are encouraged to take sweetened with honey because of other health benefits that come with honey. But because honey may be a little bit expensive and unavailable in some places, then uh, people, especially in developing countries, uh, tend to use sugar. Then the add on to it, it becomes a lemonade where maybe drops of lemon can be added or some people go ahead and start adding citric acid. 
but preferably is to just add one or two drops. Let me emphasize, and I'm putting that the herbal tea we are talking about is not these teas where some people call tea and really there is no Camellia sinensis inside. We are talking about, or what I'll be presenting is herbal teas or a tea beverage, which is made from the leaves or buds or uh, tender shoots of Camellia sinensis, and then you infuse into it edible, part of uh, non-tea leaves, bulk roots, uh, flowers, or fruits, sometimes all this. And I know that the, my person who has presented before me has talked about the common herbs, but from our end, some of the herbs that we grow or are common to added in tea are more, I think I would think is uh, based on uh, the ease to grow, are they drought resistant, and the few that I've mentioned here is not all, but, but a few. We've got hibiscus, which is added to tea. We call it hibiscus tea. Ginger seems to be common to many of us globally. Peppermint, uh, cinnamon, rosemary, and, and masala. Masala tea is a mixture of a lot of spices, cloves, etc., which is sold ready-made in the market. However, we also have, a, I'll call it a mixed concussion. This is the one which you cannot duplicate tomorrow because it is made in different ways by different people and, um, and all mixed together according to what is available. However, all this makes or would constitute what we are calling the herbal teas, especially in developing country and what is in use. More so the, in, the ones which have really increased usage with the coming up of COVID-19. Um, so having that in mind that you're talking about a Camellia sinensis beverage, which has been infused, we can now go to the question that I've put um, on whether herbal teas have dietary, can be used for dietary management of COVID-19, is it an imagination or is it proven scientifically? And with science, we say that there is a method, there is a procedure and there are results or outcomes that really herbal teas can be used to manage uh, COVID-19. I also want to bring into mind that this COVID virus has been mutating as we have, now we are on Omicron. And um, for that reason, that even makes it more complex because we could have asked why well, be working with Delta before and just before you're working with Delta, another variant comes in. And, uh, and now there are the hypotheses to be taken. So that makes the whole issue of dietary management very complex because of variation in different uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, I you would have thought that uh, Dr. Um, Nande and I had talked before, but we hadn't. But, but we kind of look at the whole thing of uh, management, although it has its integrated or uh, integrative function of medicine, which I enjoyed listening to very much. But I also want to emphasize the fact that if we are going to look at a uh, herbal teas for dietary management, we can look at what is very easy and factual. That is nutritional, which you can do composition, and more so of interest are the micronutrients, vitamins and mineral salts, and the phytonutrients, which are the other nutrients that have got bioactive compounds. We can also look at the health benefits with clinical studies what has been mentioned before about the randomized control trials, whether you can also use animal studies or you can go to the lab and you do in vitro in test tubes that mimics or simulates the human being. However, we cannot just go this way as far as diet management is concerned without also looking at the psychological effect of those drinks because there are some people who just take, and I like the sharing that was there before, the fact that 
just what one thinks about a drink or a food has got an impact, a physiological effect on their health status. We also know that some people take their teas as a cultural or as a for ceremonial some in terms of belief. And uh, some of them is a dietary habit. Look at it here, especially here in Kenya, where people after they finish eating food, they will always ask for a cup of tea. So we look at the impact of herbal teas, not just from what can be seriously tabulated in scientific nutritional, but also we can look at it from another aspect, psychological, and last but not the least, the socioeconomic aspect. Socioeconomic aspect coming very strongly, more so for us here, because of the increased cost of uh, medical cure, I mean, or treatment, as well as the looking at these herbal drinks as a way of generating income. Can they be sold? And that way people get an income out of it. And so you see that the, 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 the consumption may be, tend to go up, not because of whatever else there is here, but the fact that if somebody can make money out of it, then well and good, they won't go ahead and uh, sell this thing. Of course, we have been warned about labeling and there are many other ways of promotions that are prohibitory. However, it's sometimes very hard to control people from how they will um, promote a product, knowing of course there are regulatory bodies that control that. So we look at this uh, herbal medicine, I mean, sorry, herbal teas man in management of COVID either from nutritional health, psychological, or socioeconomic dimension. As a food technologist, I'm a food science by background. We know that we also look at the sensory properties of a product. We know the first thing that would make somebody eat something is how it looks, whether we want it or not, irrespective of its nutritional benefits, how a product looks, how a product smells and how a product feels in the mouth tastes is very important. But the good news is this. For example, our sales at Karatina University Tea Institute, we are very keen and I'm also very keen and interested in product development. We are looking at different products that we are developing using tea as a base and as well as uh, adding other herbs. But one of the things that is coming out very strong is the fact that the aroma seems to be improving as we are in perception of consumer. We are now looking at sensory attributes as seen from a consumer per preference. The color, if you look at even the products that are being displayed there, the color comes out uh, very well, ranging from uh, pink. And if we had, this is particularly purple tea. If we had green tea, you can imagine the ranges of color we would have here. The smell apparently uh, comes out very well when we add herbs, which is a plus. And the mouth feel just how it feels when in the mouth and the rolling and other things that we do. And I don't want to bog you with that. As far as sensory evaluation of teas, I mean, of drinks is concerned, herbal teas or adding herbs uh, tend to be have a positive effect. Then there's another experiment we are conducting, which I would want to mention here about probiotic yogurt fortified with purple tea. Sorry, that it seems to have been cut off from your presentation. But uh, we're going for probiotic because of gut benefits and the uh, issues that go with the benefits of taking probiotic. Then now this is like a combined uh, synergy of uh, adding tea and we look and I'm glad that whoever was there before me has really emphasized what and made my work a bit easier uh, on the benefits of tea. So we are deriving, trying to make a product using purple tea because of anthocyanins, as well as trying to get the benefits that goes with probiotic, the life microorganisms. And the, the experiment is still ongoing. So let me just stop there, but that was for appetizing that there is a lot we can do with tea, not just as a village of, uh, of uh, the normal way we do, but also with yogurt and many other smoothies, etc. 
Now, on the health benefits, I thought, let me a little bit emphasize, but I'm glad I will brush to it because it has been done very well previously, that tea has got bioactive compounds, and uh, all this has been talked about, the polyphenols, the catechins, the caffeines, the flavonoids, and the theanine, the minute quantity of amino acids, and the benefits has been well said about promoting sleep. Then when we now add the herbs, we even now have another added advantage of uh, the micronutrients that we get in terms of vitamins and of interest in COVID is the vitamin C. You also have the issues of dietary fiber, which is good for digestion. Mineral salts, more so when it comes to COVID, we are looking at zinc and uh, fiber and essential oils that come with some of those uh, herbs. And last but not least, which is down here, which you may not be clear to you, is water. You know very well that tea, part of most of the tea, more than 70%, 20% is water, which is good for rehydration. So that, when we come from a nutritional perspective, is a big plus as far as tea is concerned. Question, and I maybe I should have started from here, is that you can look at tea from a prophylactic prevention or therapeutic treatment point of view. I must emphasize here at right from the word go that COVID-19 virus is quite new. However, previous studies and has been said before have shown benefits of tea from a perspective of antioxidant, well said, scavenging free radicals, antibacterial and all other correlated bacterial infections, not necessarily for COVID-19, but for other virus. So having antiviral studies that have been done in terms of uh, uh, stopping or reducing replications of the virus, I don't want to really go into that science, but all those have got documented evidence issues of improved immunomodulation, and, uh, and in terms of people with compromised immunity, like people with type 2 diabetes, HIV, uh, AIDS patients, etc., having benefits that are derived from tea. A good presentation given before on in reduction of inflammations and infections, and improving sleep more so that has been popularized under taking chamomile tea. There, for that reason, it brings out the fact that we cannot just say that uh, herbal tea is a myth. There must be something forth and good that is in these herbal teas that brings out studies from all over the world. I just looked through some of the studies that are ongoing right now. China, South Africa, even ourselves here in Africa. Specifically, I noticed that in South Africa, they're already working on their robust tea for supportive role in playing in COVID-19 pathetic and the potential to modulate cytokine storm induced by the COVID virus. That's a study that is ongoing from November. I mean, the article I got was in November 2021. In China, we have been just been told that the Qing Si Habo tea, indeed, they are doing, we are doing research and trying to see uh, whether there is reduction of expression of uh, the COVID virus of infected persons. And um, then we got studies that are also ongoing in Europe and a combined team that is looking on the effect or is there evidence of herbal medicine as content on, uh, or in working in con collaborations with other medical medicines in um, alleviation or, or even treating symptoms and improving well beings of COVID patients? That is an article UV that has been published also and, uh, and an ongoing work. And I don't want to really talk much about a work that is already ongoing with others. But what does this show you? It shows you that this cannot just be a myth if it is being done and investigated everywhere. There must be something good about this herbal teas 
and good that they are doing that is worth being investigated. For ourselves, we have gone ahead and started to do some analysis on green, white, purple tea. And uh, this has been done before in these beverages. You can really get literature in terms of uh, pH, in terms of vitamin content, or no tea, has no vitamin as it is. And that's why the herbs do a good job. Tetopolyphenols and the cyanines up to crude fiber and uh, crude, um, what is this, mineral salts that are, first of all, as tea on its own. And then we did an analysis on the herbs on their own. It's a whole range. It all depends on the herb you're using. And that's why I don't want to emphasize this. I have to spend more time because if you're using lemon, if you're using ginger, if you're using, I put lemon here because we are analyzing lemon because in all of these drinks, people tend to add one drop of lemon. Uh, and then they put ginger, they put hibiscus and sometimes wild berries just for the ease for making it. Then we got the herbal teas themselves coming out strongly. And I hope I could put this a little bit up is on the ongoing and future studies that are coming up with the fact that we would want to do more on dietary fiber because we know the benefits that go with fiber and the individual minerals that could be on these herbs, the zinc, the iron, the sodium, etc. And then further research that is very necessary is to see whether there is synergetic or antagonistic effect when you mix all this. Previous studies have shown that really adding quantities of different herbs may not add to the maybe antioxidant capacity that one would wish to add when you go to certain levels. So the issues of concentration, so that you don't have antagonistic effect when you add these herbs to the tea, need to be evaluated. And that's part of what we are, our study is all about and is still ongoing. But that is where what we feel that is very important as we look at the herbal spice teas that have become very popular. I don't have the statistics of how many people or populations that are using, but you can be very sure that, especially in Kenya where I come from, whether people are using them aromatically, I mean, as aroma therapy, just by smell, by nose, or by drinking, more so when they are told they are COVID positive and some of them who cannot afford to go to for medical care is on a high increase. In conclusion to my presentation is the fact that there is no scientific evidence that recommends for or against the use of herbs in dietary management or mitigation of COVID-19. However, it is for sure there is need for research to be research to be carried on or future research. And so more ending from the previous presenter, you would have thought we shared notes, we didn't, is the fact that we must have proven randomized controlled trials on humans before we conclude it does. We must have efficacy, biosafety, hygiene standards. More so hygiene, I'll bring it here because tea is made with water, is made by touching hands. And, uh, and especially in, in developing countries where there are no maybe blenders and things like that. We've got to have studies done to see the hygienic standards of those teas and the socioeconomic impacts of those tea in terms of generating income, psychological effects of the tea, environmental and risk assessment related with those tea. And so I want to say thank you for listening to me and for my presentation. Any questions are welcomed. Thank you. Well, th first, first of all, thank you, Dr. Macheri, for a very um, informative uh, presentation. Um, just to remind everyone and to pick up on what Dr. Nada also addressed in her uh, Q&A session, 
uh, foods and dietary supplements are not designed to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So certainly we want all people to be uh, as healthy as possible and mitigate the symptoms from COVID-19. Um, but we also heard your uh, presentation very clearly that more research would be needed before any health claims could be made related to uh, T and uh, COVID. However, certainly, like you pointed out, the psychological benefit of ah, just enjoying that cup of tea is always a health promoting activity. And that now leads us to our next presentation uh, for today. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues at UC Davis, Eric Fausick, who's a librarian in the School of Veterinary Medicine and also a team a member of our first year seminar on Global Tea Initiative here at UC Davis. Um, Eric uh, is considered as the personal librarian for all of our students in the Global Tea Initiative first year seminar. Uh, he and his colleague Zoe Peralta Page and, um, let's see, and uh, sorry, and Gabri uh, Gabrielle Tercil are going to uh, lead a presentation on mindfulness meditation entitled Improving Anxiety and Well-Being with a Tea Meditation, a novel approach geared for the veterinary professional community and beyond. Eric, thank you and your team for your presentation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Very grateful to the GTI um, for letting us present this topic. Um, what we wanted to do is we do want to create a, a live uh, or we wanted to do um, a shared mindfulness tea um, moment together. So my thought is um, I'd like to give everyone um, maybe uh, seven to 10 minutes to um, actually get their kettles on, get their water heated if they need to. Um, maybe take a quick bio break if they need to as well, but uh, just give an opportunity to do that. So that way we can kind of talk about it a little bit and then actually have uh, that mindful moment uh, together uh, in this virtual environment. So I'm going to give everyone an opportunity uh, to do that real quick um, as I start getting the slides up and everything else. We'll start up at uh, 1045. So I'm going to give everyone a few minutes just to, to get their water heated up um, and prepared so we can do this together, have a shared moment.
Okay. So while you're uh, warming the tea, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how this came to be. Uh, this was really uh, the embodiment of, of what's wonderful about the Global Tea Initiative, because I have always had an interest in tea. I've been in the veterinary profession uh, uh, for a long time as a veterinary technician. Um, I've worked in the veterinary environment um, and seen firsthand uh, the lack of well-being uh, in that circumstance. And uh, when I came here to UC Davis as a librarian uh, in 2018, um, I kind of wanted to marry these two passions of mine. Um, you know, tea is something that I really embrace since um, 2005, especially in gong fu technique. Uh, I remember going to a, a tea house in Philadelphia with my wife and learning about how to have such a high amount of tea and uh, a little teapot and water, um, you know, a relatively small amount of water versus, you know, a tea bag and a mug. And I've fallen in love with tea since then. Uh, this has been um, a passion. Tea has been a passion of mine. I was so excited when I came to Davis to see that the Global Tea Initiative existed. Um, and I wanted to see how could I incorporate this to help support the veterinary community. And this really kind of became um, a unique circumstance uh, in terms of being able to um, develop this because I had the opportunity to meet Zoe, which we'll, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment, and Gabby uh, in the first year seminar, Zoe in our Global Tea seminar, and Denise Dempsey uh, through uh, the School of Vet Med uh, through Professor Lynette Hart. Um, what I will do is I want to go over here. I want to talk a little bit about what this presentation is going to be about, uh, what our um, goals are in this presentation. First of all, uh, just kind of making a general, I think this has come to a head in the age of COVID-19 in general, but originally what we did uh, develop this for was for a particular population in mind, uh, the veterinary population, the veterinary professional population, uh, because of the high risk of occupational burnout that exists in the field. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about that high risk population, but how the development of this particular practice of uh, doing a mindful tea practice has actually going is actually going to be uh, hopefully of benefit to a larger audience that's suffering from anxiety, stress, and burnout um, in today's environment and with uh, with COVID nineteen broadly. The other piece of our presentation is we do want to talk about um, how just putting into regular practice, putting into short practice, um, just having a short moment um, to really just kind of take a mindful moment with tea, just five minutes a day, or just a regular period that we can actually um, be able to benefit from it. So putting this into regular practice, how it's gonna be of a benefit. Um, I see that the sound is low. Is it true, anybody? Can you hear me? Okay. Hello? I think you're okay, yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, sorry, I just saw the sound uh, was, was uh, might be low. <clears throat> the other benefit that we found in the process of uh, looking at tea and mindfulness is that uh, mindful conversation is an important piece and tea has always been a large part of social practice and uh, it's actually been part of the presentations. Um, Dr. Machiri has actually talked about the psychological benefit and uh, of sharing tea. So looking at tea also as a social tool for reducing apprehension conversation, for um, improving how we communicate with each other. Um, so that was kind of the, the goals of this project that we worked on. Um, I really want to introduce uh, the people that, that have made this possible. Um, this is not something um, that any one person can do by themselves, I think. Um, it was really a great opportunity um, to, to uh, meet. First, um, I think 
I first want to point out Zoe Peralta Page. I want to introduce or have Zoe introduce herself, but it really was a great opportunity to meet Zoe uh, via what's called the Global Tea Scholars uh, Network. And this is for um, all individuals interested in the research um, and um, um, kind of networking people interested in the research of tea together. And it was really a great opportunity to meet Zoe, who's been, uh, who's a therapist and has already started thinking about tea um, in her practice. So Zoe, I'll allow you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zoe Peralta Page, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor associate um, in the state of Washington. And I work as a therapist at You Grow Girl, which is a behavioral health organization uh, dedicated to inspiring uh, female identifying youth within the Seattle, King County, Snohomish, and Pierce County in Washington. Um, and we do this through mentoring and counseling and uh, sisterhood. And so, what I focus on specifically is I work with um, girls in the foster care system and teens and families in recovery, and then also um, female identifying populations across the lifespan um, who live with PTSD. And I actually learned about the Global Tea Initiative from a talk that uh, Dr. Burnett did at the Northwest Tea Festival in Seattle back in 2019. And then from there, it just inspired um, curiosity about like how tea and mental health or how tea could impact mental health. And then from there, um, as Eric shared, I had met him through the Global Tea Scholars and then um, began working with uh, Gabby and Denise and um, building out this uh, mindful tea meditation, which we'll share with you today. Thanks so much, Zoe. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Gabby, who's here with us today as well. I met Gabby uh, in the first year seminar uh, for uh, the Global Tea Initiative. We have a first year seminar that we offer every winter. Um, and I had the privilege of meeting Gabby in last year's seminar, uh, the first year I, I um, uh, participated in that seminar. And uh, it was really great to meet Gabby because she was very interested in um, using tea in mindful practice. Um, and she had a background, um, uh, she comes from a background of a Buddhist tradition where tea has played a prominent role. And she's really given such great introspection and contributed, contributed so much in terms of original um, uh, presentation of this content. I'm really grateful uh, that Gabby did participate with us in this. Uh, Gabby, do you want to talk a little bit more about yourself and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Gabby Tercel. I'm a second year economics major at UC Davis. I met Eric through the first year seminar last year when I was a first year taking it uh, just for fun. I was always interested in tea and I grew up Buddhist. So those two things kind of intertwined. When I went off to college, I think I really lacked that meditation aspect of my life that I got from going to temple every week and uh, finding ways to supplement that through our program and through developing a program were really great um, tools that I think everybody should participate in. So thank you. And uh, she couldn't make it today, but um, I do want to uh, mention Denise Dempsey. Um, she has been... Um, a practitioner in mindful practice. She's been an educator in mindful practice for a very long time. Um, she has, um, I'll put a link, um, actually, she's recently published a book um, on mindful practices uh, that you can put into everyday use. Um, I met her through uh, Dr. Lynette Hart um, at the vet school who participated, um, who I've been talking uh, with about uh, developing kind of these mindful tea sessions. And uh, she's like, oh, you got to meet Denise. And Denise has been such an invaluable part of this process as well. Um, very grateful that she could help us in this project. And sorry, uh, she couldn't make it today, but um, hopefully we'll cover her piece um, um, and do her justice. But she, she really has contributed a lot in terms of how we can kind of structure this and set this up and how to have participants kind of use self-reflection in the process of doing um, this mindful tea um, process, uh, um, project. So um, we started with focusing on the, um, so I'm a student services librarian. Um, I do support um, uh, education in undergraduate um, programs uh, for health sciences. Um, but specifically, um, I deal directly with the School of Veterinary Medicine um, and um, work with that population um, over on the health sciences side of campus at UC Davis. And 
this was one of the areas uh, recent studies in 2018 has found um, that one in four veterinarians have contemplated suicide. 66% um, of uh, veterinary practitioners can be uh, cons or could be considered clinically depressed. Um, and it's an area that's become um, uh, a major point of concern for the profession of uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association and all the state medical associations and um, national organizations like the uh, National American Veterinary Technician Association have all started uh, addressing uh, the lack of wellness, the lack of well-being in the veterinary field. And I'm going to let Zoe talk a little bit more about um, what principles kind of apply or, or contribute to the fact that um, uh, this profession is under uh, so much duress. Yes, so um, we'll start off talking about occupational stress. Um, so how many of us have felt really stressed at work? Right, so um, occupational stress is chronic stress or can be stress coming specifically from work, right? And so it's very normal and very typical, um, but burnout can come from chronic stress, right? So it's kind of almost feeling like never ending. And so burnout is like this general exhaustion and lack of interest and motivation um, that can occur. And what can happen over time as burnout continues to progress, um, we can fall into compassion fatigue. And so compassion fatigue is also known as secondary trauma stress or vicarious trauma stress, which refers to the negative emotions that individuals feel from helping others. And this is very common across all um, helping professions, including the veterinary um, community. So um, just to quickly like break down um, the pieces of uh, burnout and compassion fatigue. So it can impact us cognitively, um, which um, can be like professional isolation, lower um, concentration and emotionally, which could be numbness, anger, sadness, guilt. Behaviorally, we tend to withdraw or have difficulty sleeping. And then physically, which can be increased heart rate. Um, we can have muscle and joint pain. And it can also um, impair our immune system. So with this particular group in mind and with these particular stressors, which, um, you know, and I'm grateful to Zoe kind of pointing out that this is not necessarily specific to the veterinary population, but um, something that the veterinary population um, uh, does suffer from. Uh, we looked at... Um, we wanted to get a sense of what the role of tea and stress and anxiety um, plays. Uh, there's already been mentioned, uh, I know, by one of the guests uh, when they were talking to Dr. Nada about, um, uh, you know, the psychological role of tea, and Dr. Maturi has talked about it as well. Um, tea is a huge social instrument, uh, particularly in, in multiple cultures, where it, it actually engenders uh, social relationships. It build social networks, which can't be dismissed um, as having a, an important mental effect as well, a positive mental effect as well. Um, there was some um, very strong uh, cross-sectional studies that had a very um, um, indirect relationship with the higher consumption of tea, the lower the rate of um, depression in those populations. And while tea does have a lot of chemicals, a lot of phytonutrients that, that may contribute to reducing um, stress, uh, one of the, the big factors that, that have to be considered is just the social component of tea and the nature of the fact that when we think about tea, everyone does tend to be a little more relaxed. Um, that being said, though, there are um, a number of primary studies out there that have looked at um, the um, components of tea that think uh, they may have um, uh, direct or indirect impact on mental health and improving um, uh, mood as well as reducing anxiety and stress. Um, in our keynote uh, uh, presentation, L-theanine was uh, one of the non-protein amino acids that was pointed out that has um, anxiolytic or, or an anxiety reducing effect um, that tea is, is a unique component to tea. And 
What's particularly interesting is L-theanine um, has been used in research to look at individuals with anxiety and stress as being a supplement. And there is promise that it may be an adjunct supplement uh, for those with anxiety and stress. But I one of the interesting pieces of tea um, that Dr. Hackman could certainly talk a lot more about um, is the fact that while we're trying to look at all these little individual components, it's really the combination of components that make tea unique. And in combination with caffeine and arginine, which are also components inside of tea, we see a certain synergy of effect, or we believe there's a synergy of effect that elevates mood and decreases stress. Primary studies have also found that AGCG um, has a calming effect, even though it may be somewhat uh, um, antagonistic with L-theanine in effect. And gallic acid, uh, which is another component of tea, has been found uh, to potentially have calming, uh, reducing stress effects. So there are a number of components in tea itself that seem to be beneficial in reducing stress. So as a beverage or as, a, uh, uh, as an instrument, uh, in our mindful practice, tea was a natural choice. Um, also, as has been pointed out, tea is the second most consumed beverage in the world. So it's one that we can all recognize and um, agree on uh, to some extent. So it's, it's a pretty well um, uh, received uh, component. So we look at these uh, phytochemicals that seem to be beneficial. There's already kind of this per perception of tea. Most people, when they think of tea, they think of calming and relaxing. And then in certain um, uh, cultural groups and certain um, populations, tea has always been a big part of community, a big part of interaction. So tea seemed like a very logical and easy choice uh, for this kind of mindful project that we wanted to do um, and develop with the School of Vet Med. The next piece that we um, wanted to look at is the practice of mindfulness. Um, mindfulness, of course, um, does have Buddhist roots um, and was carried over John Kabat-Zinn um, uh, and I apologize, I missed the dates on this, but probably in the 70s, 80s ish kind of time frame, but has really taken up um, in a lot of the mental health fields. Um, Denise Dempsey has done a lot of work of the School of Nursing at UC Davis, um, and this has become a pretty common uh, process or pretty common. Um, inclusion in a lot of medical schools, dental schools, nursing schools to reduce occupational stress. Uh, mindfulness has, uh, mindfulness programs have shown um, real legitimate benefit. There's been a number of synthesis uh, studies that have found that it has had a benefit. Um, amongst those studies, uh, what um, Gabby and myself did was we, we did look at a number of the um, uh, uh, cases of introducing mindfulness into uh, the veterinary profession. Uh, so we, what we did was we did compile uh, a number of studies that have been out there um, that have included mindfulness. And I'm going to let Gabby talk a little bit about this chart that we have up here. Um, but these were all the studies uh, that we kind of incorporated, including one that looked at using mindfulness in the human health professions, uh, the McConville et al. in 2017. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So basically, one of the common misconceptions about mindfulness is that it is a narrow, focused field. But as you can see on the graph, there's a different like number of mindfulness uh, based like interventions such as muscle relaxation as well as uh, communication which we focused on as well as so many different ways to measure it some of the common ones were the DAS which is the, the depression anxiety and stress scale as well as the MASS which is the mindful uh, mindful attention awareness scale um, and many others uh, as listed under scales used this also makes it a challenge for us in the future if we want to measure the effectiveness of our program to decide which scales would be most effective versus which um, wouldn't contribute the most to our uh, not study, but communication mindfulness. Um, so as you can see, they are all in the positives. So all of these studies, although they may be statistically insignificant due to the lack of a comparison group, they're all in the positive. So no matter what type of mindfulness was practiced, um, they all had a net positive effect on whoever was uh, in the group that experienced them. 
which is a good sign for us because um, the positive net positive means that mindfulness is truly effective in calming the mind and reducing stress and anxiety. But that this is something we're going to address later on in our own program. So. Great. So um, when we started, um, so Gabby and I uh, started thinking about how we could uh, present this. We wanted to make sure that mind, uh, that we could make this accessible to everyone. So we came up with a few different um, uh, concepts of how to do this mindful approach with tea, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but we didn't, what was interesting was a dearth of uh, existing uh, talk about how tea could be incorporated in meditation or mindfulness in the academic literature, um, especially in the health sciences literature uh, in terms of mindful practice. Uh, I looked in Psych Info, uh, which is a, a large uh, American Psychological Association index of literature. We looked at Psych Articles, um, which is another uh, literature index uh, for the psychology profession. Um, PubMed, which probably uh, many are familiar with, which is the preeminent medical uh, database and uh, some anthropological databases, Anthrosource, um, to see if we could find um, any existing kind of uh, tea practices in mindfulness. And what was sad is there was a dearth of it. So we were initially building out, looking at a few sources. Um, for instance, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, had an interview with Oprah. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, being uh, a famed uh, Buddhist um, um, that, that kind of talks about mindfulness uh, from the Buddhist perspective and has, has contributed significantly uh, in, in a lot of uh, our understanding of Buddhism uh, in literature and talking and speeches. Uh, there was a, there's a journal that uh, the UC Davis Library um, recently got access to called um, Global Tea Hut, which is an organization um, out of Taiwan, I believe, um, that talks about um, using tea and mindfulness. So we kind of looked at some of those sources. Um, and then uh, there's a popular YouTube uh, place that, that I went to called Mayleaf um, Tea that talked a little bit about mindfulness and tea. So we kind of looked at some of these components to kind of start building out uh, what, how to do this, this um, mindful tea kind of exercise, this guided mindful tea process. Um, but what really came of benefit, what really contributed to this project was Zoe already started utilizing um, some evidence-based principles in um, therapy to make um, mindful tea practice. And Zoe, I'm gonna let you talk about what you developed at Washington. Yeah, so I'm gonna go into a little bit about um, how, like what kind of therapeutic ideology that was behind some of this. So um, dialectical behavioral therapy is a type of like cognitive behavioral therapy that really focuses on teaching um, individuals how to use mindfulness to address stress and other, um, you know, different various mental health um, issues that they encounter on day to day. And mindfulness is at core of this um, therapy. And so one of the techniques um, is, is called self-soothing with the five senses. And so essentially, um, I try to just like merge the two, right? So with tea and the five senses, how can we elevate the experience of enjoying our cup of tea, right? And so with, um, you know, with our sight, right? Noticing the color of the water changing. What do we hear? Noticing the sound of the water heating up right? So touch, so drawing awareness to the texture of the cup, the temperature, um, you know, as you're holding it. Um, taste, what do you notice in the flavors? Um, and then aroma, right? So as the tea brews, what do you notice um, changing? And so building this out step-by-step step into three parts, right? So there is heating up the water once the water is ready, and then once the tea is brewed. And so to begin, right, so we begin to heat water to the desired temperature. And then this part of the process, you want to begin to center your breath, right? And so it's two to three cycles of um, diaphragmic box breathing um, while it's brewing and steeping. Um, and so that would be, you know, three seconds inhale, two seconds hold, three seconds in exhale, and then two seconds hold. 
And that really helps us control our breathing um, in the moment. And so as the water is ready, um, you can engage with this um, with eyes open or closed, whatever is most comfortable for the individual. And then this is where we'll begin to focus on sight if eyes are open, and then also our sense of um, smell. And then, you know, typically with meditations, we set an intention. And then once the tea is brewed, we pause between each drink and engaged in a practice as long as desired. Um, and I think that's one of the really nice pieces because this could be as short as five minutes. Um, in some cases, um, you know, I've been able to engage in this for a few brewings of tea, which has been a nice half hour um, or even an hour. So it's it's nice that, um, you know, it kind of you can move the time around. So what we wanted to do now. Um, well, first, I want to talk about uh, so on our site and I'll put a link to the site uh, once we're, we're done with the presentation here, but we've created um, three kind of um, uh, ways of, of uh, allowing the individual uh, participant to kind of um, take a self-guided um, uh, way of doing this mindful tea meditation. We have a video, we have a podcast audio, and we made an infograph um, that we made available on our uh, mindful tea meditation site. And uh, we did it with kind of, um, uh, three goals, or with kind of three sections. One was to make it most accessible. Everyone has a bowl at home. So we did a bowl tea session where all you need to do is put tea in the bowl and pour the water in. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, one of our sponsors, uh, Kucha, Kucha Tea House, um, I, I got to meet Rong um, over at Kucha, and uh, she mentioned uh, utilizing uh, the Gai Wan. Uh, which is also you can drink directly from the gaiwan and use the lid of it to push the tea away. So it'll probably be a, um, an area of interest to maybe do another guided piece um, with that using the gaiwan as opposed to a bowl. But it starts with the bowl. We also created one for folks that are interested in teaware um, using gong fu technique, um, which is using um, either a gaiwan or a tiny teapot. Um, to do this kind of mindful practice. So using the tea wares uh, that tea enthusiasts um, enjoy so much. So with our audience in mind uh, for this uh, particular uh, colloquium, we decided we would do um, the meditation with, uh, um, with the tea ware. So hopefully your water is ready, but we wanted to do this together. So we're gonna um, play this video and we want everyone to take a moment to um, have a mindful sip of tea. To begin this journey, you need at least a small teapot or gaiwan and a larger cup or a fairness cup to pour the tea into. Every tea takes different temperatures to brew, but essentially, Always keep the water just below boiling, and cooler is better for white or green teas and hotter for darker teas like black teas, poors, or oolongs. Try to choose a place away from your everyday. Just like you shouldn't stay awake in bed, don't stay in front of your computer or in the same place you do your everyday work or tasks. Dedicate a space away from your everyday, nothing too big, but distinct. Begin heating your water. Now try to relax and take stock of everything going on with you, physically and mentally. You can be happy, sad, or anything in between, but treat each with equanimity. Acknowledge these feelings and begin to focus on the task at hand. Use this time to begin box breathing. Breathing in for three seconds, hold for two, exhale for three seconds, and then hold again for two seconds. As you breathe, begin to draw awareness to what you hear in your environment. Repeat this breathing. Inhale, two, three, hold, two, exhale, two, three, hold, two, until your water is ready. Pour the water into the teapot and be messy. Let it spill out a bit. Put the lid on and pour more water, water on it.
this point, pour the water into the teapot and take deep, three deep breaths. Breathing in for three seconds, holding for two, exhale for three seconds, and then hold again for two. On each inhale, extend your head and neck. On each exhale, relax your body, release tension in your face muscles. Once your tea is ready, close your eyes as you begin to set your intention for your practice. Feel free to engage in this activity with your eyes open if you feel more comfortable doing so. If you find your mind wandering, center your focus on your breath to bring you back to the here and now. Try using a cup with a white interior so you can enjoy not just the smell, but the appearance of the tea. What color is it? How does it move in the cup? Rapid like water or slow like oil across a pan? Feel the warmth of your cup. Think about the amazing journey this tea has taken to be enjoyed by you. Tasting the tea is now your home base. Enjoy the moment, the warmth, the color. Think about the flavors. Tea can be as complex as wine. What do you notice? Grass tastes? Caramel tastes? You can repeat this with a good tea for at least six times. Just add one more box breathing step for each steeping. So you start with three. For the next steeping, do four box breaths of inhale, two, three, hold, two, exhale, two, three, hold, two. Enjoy your tea and your meditation. Hopefully that uh, was a nice moment that everyone got to share. Um, the next phase or what we started doing in the fall uh, was starting to have tea in conversation. So we started using um, uh, tea as kind of the, the mechanism for mindful conversation to improve active listening because in the first round of tea, the idea is that none of us speak. So it's just a moment to kind of enjoy each other and the fact that we'll never have a moment like this again. So what we do for our mindful tea conversations is the first round, um, we just enjoy in silence. Uh, mindful conversation is a relatively new approach that was used um, uh, in a joint study, I think with Idaho State and um, uh, Kansas State University for the vet students. Um, for those students that, that had conversation apprehension, because there's a lot of difficult conversations uh, to be had in veterinary medicine. So one of the things we found is it's, it's a really great opportunity to um, appreciate conversation more and also to allow everyone to kind of share ideas. And, and essentially what we do with these um, mindful tea conversations is um, really trying to build a sense of community. And it's been very successful uh, this fall. We've had full bookings until the weather got kind of cold. Um, I'm really happy that Gabby got to join us. I don't know if you had any um, thoughts or anything you wanted to say about those uh, mindful conversations, Gabby? Um, I think that it was interesting how many different types of people kind of came. So people from the first year seminar that Eric teaches in, as well as professors, grad students, they all kind of came together for this one uh, tea meditation from all over the world, some international, some from here, but they all uh, had a deep appreciation for tea, which I thought was a great way to base a conversation on. Um, I thought it was very enjoyable and relaxing. It didn't take too much out of my day. And I hope that in the future, more people can attend after COVID ends and we can have bigger group conversations. Absolutely. So um, that's our presentation. Um, I just wanted to throw out some special thanks out there. Um, besides, of course, my collaborators in doing this, um, Janelle L. Lang, Ann Lang um, and the UC Davis Veterinary Career Leadership and Wellness Group uh, for the School of Veterinary Medicine 
um, have been such great uh, uh, feedback boards. They, they've been um, actively promoting what we've been doing and uh, so helpful in input. Um, very grateful to them. Catherine Burnett, of course, this wouldn't even exist without Catherine. So Catherine and the GTI, um, thank you so much. And the Global Tea Scholars uh, Network, I would never have met Zoe if not for the Global Tea Scholars. So very grateful for that. And of course, Dr. Lynette Hart, who not only introduced me to Denise Dempsey um, that we could bring into our project group, um, but also has been a regular attendee um, of our mindful uh, tea meditations on Tuesdays. So uh, that is our presentation. Um, I want to put in the links real quick, um, our mindful uh, tea meditation page. So. Uh, I encourage anyone to visit that. Um, I may also, I'm also going to put in the links. We do have a podcast for the GTI um, where there is a meeting between um, uh, all of us, Gabby, Zoe, um, and Denise, uh, where we're talking about this project as well. So I'm going to put a link to that too. I think I sent that to everyone. Oh, no, I did not. Hold on. Um, that's our presentation. Thank you uh, so much, Gabby. Um, Zoe, thank you for being here and doing this as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jess Carricker, and I am a student here at UC Davis. And I will be moderating this Q&A session. Um, so please continue putting your questions into the Q&A function if you have any more uh, for Eric Fausick and the whole team. Um, and please do specify if you would like the question to be um, spe specifically for one of those people. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, one of the first questions is for Mary Marjorie. And oh, is she here yet? I can go to Eric and team instead, if not. I'm here. Hi, Mary. Hi. All right. So one of the questions for you is somebody is curious about cloning these purple leaf tea varieties and other new varieties of tea. And if you can speak a little bit more about that. Okay. Yeah, the purple tea, um, the, the purple tea clone leaf was a leaf, is a, a kind of a, a tea, it still can, can it's still, property, let me use simple English, yeah? It's nothing different in terms of species from what we know as Camellias sinensis. However, uh, there's some been more of a, uh, okay, I'm not a genetics, but what I've heard from those who have done it, it is a patented genetic um, work that has been done in Kenya at Tea Research Institute. Uh, tea research, not ourselves, tea research station is purely uh, a station that deals with things to do with the uh, agronomy. And, uh, and I think it's patented, so maybe they may not reveal exactly how they, but it, it is actually tea that has been uh, genetically modified so that the purple comes out stronger than the green chlorophyll. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and another guest was curious um, about whether or not purple tea is processed into a powder the way matcha tea is. Okay, thank you for the question. Purple tea is processed like green tea. That is, it is not irated, but um, it is processed and irated so that you don't uh, destroy the, the bioactive compounds. Uh, however, after, it's been, after it is processed, other ways of it has been modified by taking the infusions and making it into what like we have like instant teas. 
but its processing procedures is the same way like you do for green, but take the infusion then and other food or beverages have been made, even wine has been made using purple tea. I hope that answers, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and one final question for you, Mary, is somebody was wondering whether or not there is, um, there has been any difference shown between these non-tea herbs and fruits um, versus the infusions that are made from herbs that are more typically thought of um, as tea, such as, as you mentioned, chamomile, lavender, versus like, for instance, the garlic um, and like whole food ginger. Um, is there any difference that's seen in the health benefits between those two categories? Okay, thank you. Yes, there is health benefit differences because the bioactive compounds vary in this, what is in the tea, and what is in the different uh, non, the edible non-tea compounds. Just like the presenter, was it her name was uh, Dr. Nada. Like she said, every of these compounds come with different bioactive compounds and the, their health benefits in terms of, it's all varied. However, it also depends on how the tea is brewed in terms of temperatures, like what the, just what the previous presenter has said. Brewing temperatures, all those come into play as to the benefits that you are going to be reaping from the, the particular tea. So there's no one standard thing you'd say that is common. And that is actually the difficulties that comes with studies for tea. Because different people brew it differently. And at the same time, you're dealing with a different processing procedure. And, and many other ways of how the tea is consumed, whether it is a kettle that is put on gas cooker or is it on microwave. Yet all those variations by themselves bring variation in terms of uh, health benefits. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Machuri. Um, And so the next questions are for the tea meditation team. Um, and Mostly we got a lot of thank yous. I think people were very grateful for the uh, chance to have a little calm break to the day. Uh, and so the questions that we have are actually mostly regarding the, um, uh, for instance, one person wants to know is the Tuesday tea meditation open for all? They are on the East Coast. Oh, Eric, I. Think you need to unmute? Oh yeah, there's a button here. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, uh, it's actually open to anyone. So um, I put a link to the website. Um, just register, and you can join us anytime. Perfect. And uh, somebody else is wondering how many times do you recommend doing the meditation? I think I'll defer to Zoe on that one. Yeah, um, you can um, do the tea meditation as needed and as in the duration can be as long as you want, right? And so um, the goal is, is like, if you only have like three minutes, then you can do it for three minutes. If you only want to do it for, you know, like 10, then go for it. Um, it's really more of a in the moment to help kind of bring you back for just a moment of like, okay, gonna enjoy our warm beverage <laughs> for just a few seconds if needed. Yeah, and I know personally. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and the literature, you know, I think the biggest thing is as long as it's um, consistent, you know, having a consistent kind of practice of this. And that's what we loved about this, because we know how busy veterinary practitioners are. We know how busy you are. Um, so just taking five minutes to do this, um, maybe once a week, maybe every day, um, as long as it's just a regular thing for you. That's, that's the key, too, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, whenever you're starting a new habit, it's okay to fumble. Um, I would say give yourself some grace and don't expect that, okay, I'm going to do this five days a week and I'm going to get it right every time. It is totally okay <laughs> to take some time to learn the practice. 
Sorry, Jessica, we interrupted you. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I was just going to say that I'm going to use this as an excuse to do, um, I think it's a great way to fit meditation into my day because I, um, I drink tea every day, but I don't meditate every day. <laughs> so it's a great excuse. I love it. Um, and more thank yous coming in. Thank you so much. Um, and one more question just on when what time the Tuesday meditation begins? Uh, there's currently two that I'm offering for uh, this, this spring semester slash winter spring quarter. Um, and that's um, 4.30 p.m. on Mondays with Gong Fu. So if you have teaware that you want to play with, um, it's 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. So sorry, East Coast <laughs> and every other time zone probably. Um, and then 9.30 uh, a.m. Tuesdays for the bowl tea. Um, you can, of course, bring your teaware and use that as well, but I'm focusing on the bowl tea. It's a six uh, box breathing steps as opposed to three for the gong fu. Great. Thank you so much to the tea meditation team and to everybody who presented. And uh, that was the final question. So we are going to go on a short break here. Um, and we will see you all again at noon, 